Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Welcome to Give God 90. Thank you for inviting us to be part of your day. We appreciate that. My name is Jerry Mitchell. For those of you who might be new, uh, sitting beside me is the uh, recently repaired Myra. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, we thank you, everybody. For, for those that know, she had uh, shoulder surgery uh, this past Monday. And uh, we want to thank everyone for their prayers and well wishes. Yes, we do. Especially and, for Jerry. <laughs> We appreciate uh, all the support you folks have given us. Um, if you are new to Give God 90, we certainly do appreciate you, as well as the folks who have been with us for a while. Uh, tonight, if this is your first time listening, you might hear things you didn't expect to hear. I will guarantee you that. Uh, and I try to do that often. Just, there's a warning for you. I try to you know bring things that, uh, from a perspective of... You know, let's step away from the traditions. Let's, you know, not play doctrine. Uh, you know, no matter what church you come from, we don't care. Uh, instead, let's find out what the Bible has to say. And tonight's not any different. Uh, we know uh, that there are some differences between what our modern churches say and our modern traditions say. You know, what's really going on in Scripture. Uh, and tonight is no exception. Uh, when I wrote Tradition to Truth a few years ago, um, you know, I was really kind of hoping that that would be where it stopped, but it wasn't. <laughs> it just grew <laughs> from there. Uh, the other books that we, or the other book I have out, uh, God's Universe, God's Rules, really lays down the gauntlet between what our traditions tell us and what scripture is, the way we act in church and what our, and what really it says in the Bible. When you hunt back through the language and the culture and the history, you don't step away from the difficult questions. I know a lot of times people uh, will say, well, what about this? And I'll say, well, you know, why do you, what's the Bible really say? And they get upset because they want verification that what they're thinking or the way they've been taught is real, and sometimes it's just not. And we've been talking about... Uh, spirits and uh, how to eradicate them. Uh, last week I used Leviticus 14 to demonstrate the way to eradicate an unholy spirit from a house. Uh, we find out that even today, even today we do things exactly the way our Creator established it. You know, when we have mold in the house, we take the mold out and what do we do with those scraps? We take it to an uninhabited place, an unclean place. Uh, so we take it to the landfill today, right? Right. Uh, that's exactly the instructions that were given in Leviticus 14. You know, get rid of it. It's got to leave. Now, uh, the reason is that what our Creator establishes will remain. He's not going to change it. You know, Malachi 3, 6 says, I, Jehovah, do not change so that you are not destroyed. So we know that what He establishes is going to remain. And this week, we're going to look at something uh, that a lot of people think they're familiar with, but quite honestly, they don't have a clue. And there's a lot of good pastors out there I know don't have a clue about this. <clears throat> the reason is there is a big uh, description problem in our New Testament translation that we read, all the New Testament translations in English that we read. 
Each and every one has the same issue that we're going to talk about tonight. All English New Testament translations describe something that never happened, not even one time, in the entire Old Testament. Now, before I go any farther, I need to stop and take a minute and remind everybody that's listening that the things that we see on television or in the movies, even the books we read, uh, those things about spirits and demons is primarily fiction. And we have accepted and adopted fictional traditions uh, and doctrines because we have inherited lies, just like it says in Jeremiah 16. Now, as I was researching the way the Bible explains the unholy spirits and even the demonic, I noticed something a few years ago that I had not heard anyone actually address. And I don't know why people are so terrified of this subject. It just doesn't make sense to me. It's especially something so important that we need to understand how to respond to these things. What a lot of people think of today as exorcism was never done in the Old Testament, not even one time. In fact, there are no instructions from Moses concerning exorcism, how to exorcise an unholy spirit, right, or a demon. There's no examples of any of the prophets, you know, doing what we consider exorcism today, right? We don't see it. In fact, the closest description to removing an unholy spirit is actually found in 1 Samuel, uh, and I'm going to let you read uh, 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 18, and then uh, we're going to skip some incidental stuff and go to 23. So if you can, can you do that? Okay. But the Lord's spirit had gone out of Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Saul's servant said to him, See an evil spirit from God is troubling you? Give us the command. We will look for someone who can play the harp. When the evil spirit from the Lord enters you, he will play. Then the spirit will leave you alone, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his servants, Find someone. If he plays well, bring him to me. One of the servants said, Jesse of Bethlehem has a son who plays the harp. I have seen him play it. He is a brave man and fights well. He is a good speaker and handsome, and the Lord is with him. When the evil spirit from God entered Saul, David would take his harp and play. Then the evil spirit would go out of him, and Saul would feel relief. He would feel better again. Okay. Uh, now this passage is often used to describe uh, and talk about exorcism in the Old Testament, um, but there's a problem. Where are the priests? You know, where's the screaming at the demon, right? Where's the, the shouting it out? Where's the casting it out? All David does as a shepherd is play a harp. Now, I know that the Cohen song, Hallelujah, you know, the, there's a line in there that uh, I, he, uh, I hear there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord, right? But that's a modern myth. It's a song. It's not scriptural. Let's be say that again. It was a song that somebody wrote. It is not scriptural. This is talking about David uh, playing a harp, and we'll see in a, in a little bit how this was able to bring Saul back uh, from wherever he was that this spirit had him put. More on that in a moment. This is kind of complicated uh, thing that we're talking about tonight. So as we do go work through this, as we work through this, you're going to see some things that uh, you just never thought of before. We're going to talk about some things that you probably uh, had never heard, probably never, never really wanted to know, but you're going to find them out. Um, now, some people, when it comes to David and Saul, say, well, you know, Samuel had just anointed David. Of course, you know, he was chosen. He was anointed. Do you know what the word anointed is in Hebrew? It's Messiah. Messiah simply means anointed. That's all it means. It's not a big deal. You know, 
Um, David was anointed. Saul was anointed. Samuel anointed Saul too. There was a lot of anointments going on. It simply means to be chosen for something. Uh, now, I had to ask, why is it in the New Testament? We read in passages like Matthew 10.1, When Yeshua had called the twelve, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Well, if that never happened in the Old Testament, if it wasn't written by Moses, and Yeshua said in John 6 or John 8, I believe it's John 8, where he says, I can't do anything or I can't say anything that the Father hasn't given us to say, or given me to say. Well, where did he give it to say it? Well, in the Old Testament. It was either written, he, everything he said was either written by Moses or proven in, in the prophets. If he was going to tell his disciples to do something that wasn't there, he could not be the Messiah that most Christians want him to be, and he would not have even been accepted as a prophet or even a teacher because he would have been adding to the word of the Creator. They would have, they would have laughed at him and walked away from him. He would have been nothing to them. He would not have been a teacher. He would not have influenced them at all because they would have held him up to Deuteronomy 13 and said, you are a false prophet. So anything that he had to say, anything that he had to do, had to be uh, in agreement with what's in the first five books, the books of Moses, and in the prophets. So how do we work through this issue? Well, the short answer is with great difficulty. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. It is a difficult thing to work through. I, when I when I looking through this, I began looking to find examples of unholy spirits in the Old Testament. And what I found surprises some people, and I've used this before, uh, from 1 Kings 22, you know, uh, you have a group of divine beings sitting around, the Almighty's among them, and he says, well, how are we going to persuade Ahab that he's going to go up and fail and fall at uh, Ramo Gilead. And they were giving different concepts, different ideas. These divine beings kind of sitting, you know, in my mind, they're sitting around the table or standing around the throne and they're giving these ideas. Finally, one of them said, I know how to do it. And the Almighty said, well, what's your idea? I'm paraphrasing here. No, no translation is going to say this, okay? I'm paraphrasing this to make it shorter. Um, what's your idea? He said, well, I'll just go be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And the Almighty's next words were, yes, you will, and it's going to work, right? And in verse 23 of, of uh, chapter 22, it says, and therefore, behold, the Lord had put us lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets so that <laughs> basically Ahab, when he goes up to fight, is going to fail. He's going to lose. It's the Almighty himself who allows this to happen. Now, I could I could spend a lot of time on this example, but I'm not going to. We're, we're going to be short for time anyway. But what I want to bring out is in this example a holy divine being, not an unholy spirit, but a holy divine being, is capable of masquerading as an unholy spirit with the approval of the Creator. Okay? This holy being is able to go down and convince the prophets that they need to accept them, and so they do. Now, there are other places uh, that talk about different things, but they're not a great deal of help. You know, even that example doesn't give us a lot of, of help. And then I kept looking and kept trying to fight, figure out what's going on, and I realized that it's been in front of us the whole time. Leviticus chapter 20 goes into 
a lot of detail about different variations of sexual relations, the offenders of which are to be killed. Now, that sounds a little harsh, right? Think about this. The main spirit that causes adultery or bestiality or any other number of, of sexual uh, deviations is lust. The instructions to prevent lust from spreading was to kill the offender. But why? What is it that really uh, is the, the driving force? Well, believe it or not, Lust is the parent of many unholy spirits, even addiction. When we examine the spirit world, we need to be able to uh, recognize the difference between spirits. We need to understand the way certain spirits manifest in our lives and in our homes, as we discussed last week. We need to understand where they come from. Is this spirit sent uh, from the Almighty with his authority to do something? Or is it from an unholy source? It's interesting that we get a very stern warning uh, at the near the end of Leviticus uh, chapter 20. In verses 22 and 23, it says, You will, therefore, keep all my statutes and my judgments and do them in the land that I bring you to dwell in, or it will vomit you out. Now, what happened when the uh, Israelites stopped following his instructions? It led to the exile. The land literally vomited them out, right? Verse 23, You shall not walk in the manners of the people which I cast out before you, for they committed these things, and therefore I abhorred them. The Almighty says, Look, I see what's going on over there. You shouldn't be seeing it. You shouldn't be doing it. But what did they do? They adopted all of those things. Uh, verse 24, I've said to you, you will inherit the land. I'll give it to you to possess it. A land that flows with milk and honey. I am Jehovah your God. I have separated you from other people. Now that, that separation is not just physical, but it is spiritual as well. What, he's, what it's really saying is, if we follow the instructions from the Creator, it will prevent the unholy uh, spirits from being able to influence us at all. Now, obviously, they didn't follow those instructions and bad things happened, right? They looked around you know, and they said, but those people over there, they do it like this. Those people, oh, doesn't it look like fun what those people over there are doing? They were influenced by the unholy spirits simply by looking around and seeing the way the world around them and the people of the world around them were doing things. Now, hopefully you're asking, so how do we get from preventing unholy spirits from guiding our life to exorcism? Well, I had to go there so you would understand it, right? Now, there's some really interesting writings that come from Greek sources like Plato. Plato wrote uh, in what he calls the Republic II uh, about 346 BC. Now, this is 350 years before the birth of Yeshua, right? He writes, Of the wandering Magoi and Agirai, now... We have to know who these people are, right? Because you don't have any idea who the Magoi... Right. Okay, the Magoi, it's where we get the word uh, magi, magicians, right? Which, in Matthew, they weren't magicians at all. They were astronomers. Not astrologers, astronomers. They watched the way the, the stars orbited planets, and they watched the way to different things. They weren't telling fortunes. They were simply watching the orbits of the celestial lights. Okay, okay, so that's the Magoi. Now, the Agurai, basically charlatans, okay, people who are just out to steal. These uh, magicians and charlatans, okay, of the wandering magicians and charlatans, they come to the doors of the rich and persuade them 
that they have power from the gods given by sacrifices and incantations. Isn't that interesting? They will perform purifactory rites to cure the results of transgressions by a man or his ancestors. Um, do we see any examples of that on television today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do, don't we? We do. Absolutely. I'm going to name some names here in a minute. Okay. <laughs> if that's not enough for you, what, there's something else that they can do for you, right? It says, or if the man wishes to harm someone, they can persuade the gods, with a little g, to serve them in doing so with certain charms and binding spells. What are charms? Idols. They can use these idols. What are binding spells? Basically, they're speaking, just like we talked about early on with idols last week, right? Mm -hmm. You speak to an inanimate object, and then when it's in the uh, presence of another, it will release that unholy spirit a little bit at a time and influence the person, the, the people closest to it. Hmm. Now, again, get the the movies and the TV shows and the books out of your head. You know, it's an inanimate object. It can't move. But it can influence you because it... Think of it as uh, uh, off-gassing. Okay, you know how you walk into a, a brand new house or a house that's just been painted or a house with fresh carpet and you smell the odors? It's called off-gassing. Well, it's sort of the same thing with these unholy spirits. You get this opportunity to uh, breathe in that off gas, and you're taking in that spirit that that thing is is releasing. Now, this happened when uh, Plato wrote that in around 346. It was about 200 years before the events that led to Hanukkah. That's a whole lot of time. Uh That's a whole lot of time, right, Mm -hmm. for somebody to be influenced. Now, it's kind of of interesting. They were influenced as Judean people. But, you know, when you mix people, even if it's an army, even if it's an occupying army, and we've seen examples of this throughout history, even the occupiers become influenced by those who are occupied. Uh, there's stories that come out of prison camps from World War II where Jews actually influenced the Germans in the concentration camps. But it's an interesting, there's, there's actually an interesting turn of events many people don't understand, don't even know about. Now, a lot of people have heard that the Jews don't use the name of God. They don't use the name Jehovah because uh, for whatever tradition, you know, some say it's too sacred to, to use that name, some people say, well, we've lost the name. We don't really know it. That's They know it. Trust me, they know it. Um, there's other things that go along with this. Well, what, <laughs> what actually happened is the Greeks heard the Jews and, they, and their prayers. And they were witnessing miracles. They saw the righteous doing things. They saw what was going on and they listened to these prayers. And they began to use the name of the Creator. And because there's power in the name of the Creator, guess what? The Jews, well, actually, the Greeks said, you've got to stop using that name because, look, our, our, our people are picking this up. They don't need our magicians anymore. Right? Mm-hmm. So the Pharisees, who had already agreed with the, the uh, incoming uh, army a couple of hundred years ago that they do anything that the Greeks wanted them to do said, okay, we'll stop using the name. And they forcibly made uh, the, the other priests not use the name. Isn't it amazing? There's actually, it got so bad that uh, not during this time, but even years later, there was a uh, priest who continued to use the name and they went to him and said, you've got to stop, you've got to stop, you've got to stop. He said, I'm not stopping. And finally, the Jews 
wrapped him in a Torah scroll, stuffed wet cotton in it, and set it on fire so that that wet cotton would keep it, would be hot, but it wouldn't burn him right away. It was a long, slow, torturous, painful death simply because he he continued to use the name Yehovah. Amazing things were going on in history that many of us don't realize and don't recognize. So, the Jews were influenced by the Greeks as much as the Greeks were influenced by the Jews. The Greek pagan tradition of using incantation to work their magic, in air quotes if I can, was observed by the Jews. And those traditions actually made it uh, sort of into the everyday life of most people. Well, I won't say most people, many people. Now, when the creator of the universe spoke at Mount Sinai and warned against idols, there's a reason. And it's because, and that reason was lost over time. The people living around the first century uh, BC fell into using charms, idols, and incantations instead of repentance and prayer. Nothing will replace repentance and prayer. It kind of sounds like the movies where we see the priest maybe holding a crucifix and shouting at a spirit, doesn't it? Instead, what should be done is described in the Bible. Now, there's an interesting passage in Luke 18. Uh, If you want to read 9 through 14. There were some people who thought that they were very good and looked down on everyone else. Jesus used this story to teach them. One day, there was a Pharisee and a tax collector. Both went to the temple to pray. The Pharisee stood alone, away from the tax collector. When the Pharisee prayed, he said, God, I thank you that I am not as bad as other people. I am not like men who steal, cheat, or take part in adultery. I thank you that I am better than this tax collector. I give up eating twice a week, and I give one-tenth of everything I earn. The tax collector stood at a distance. When he prayed, he would not even look up to heaven. He beat on his chest because he was so sad. He said, God have mercy on me. I am a sinner. I tell you, when this man went home, he was right with God. But the Pharisees, the Pharisee was not right with God. Everyone who makes himself great will be made humble. But everyone who makes himself humble will be made great. Okay, now I've sat in a lot of churches over the years where they have used this passage in various ways and none of them get it none of those pastors understood what was going on here the the man who was humble uh was you know they use the term tax collector publican depending on the translation he was praying a very special type of prayer known today as a vidue or vidui However, you just want to say that. There's a couple of different ways I'm told you can say that. Today, it's typically used in the Jewish community as a prayer that you would pray when you think you're dying. Okay? Back years ago, it wasn't. It was a prayer of confession. Okay? You would t- you take your fist and you would hit your chest as you prayed, Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, I am not worthy. Have mercy on me, this sinner. And as you would name your sins... You would thump your chest, and that was a very physical way of uh, stirring your soul, so to speak. You would, this prayer of confession was absolutely necessary for one major reason. Even these folks back then understood that without repentance, you don't gain forgiveness. If you don't turn around and, as as Isaiah said, as David said, as practically every prophet said, if we confess our sins to the Almighty, He will forgive us. It's their way. They understood this thing. It wasn't something new that anybody came up with. Again, if you tried to come up with something new, they, you know, your 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 ministry would last about fifteen minutes. 
right? Just about long enough for you to get the words out of your mouth and them to stone you. <laughs> That's it. That's it. What they were doing, you know, with this prayer, Father, you have to, you please have mercy on me. Forgive me. I am not worthy. I am a miserable person. I am nothing. You know, some other Sadurs I've, I've looked at uh, actually say, you know, I'm a worm, which is pretty low, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. So now that you understand that there is places in the Bible that describe, oh, maybe I should say, why Luke didn't actually go into detail about that. Who's Luke writing to? Luke's writing to Jewish people. They would have read that and they went, oh, we know what he's doing. He's praying a prayer of repentance. The Pharisees just boasting about how good he is, right? They would have, they would have gotten it. They understood those things. So now we can go on and look at this whole concept of casting out spirits and why it is impossible Yes, I said impossible for one person to cast out a spirit from another person. It can't be done. I don't care who you are. No one has the authority over another person's body. I can't pray the Holy Spirit into anyone else because I don't own that body. Which spirit we follow is our own personal choice, which is why it was so important for those who who followed the spirit of lust to be killed. They had no desire to change. They had no desire to do anything different. Now, I have to mention this because I know I'll, if I don't mention this, I will get at least one uh, question or comment. What about my body, my choice? You know, we hear that in the United States, you know, it's my body, it's my choice when it comes to abortion argument, right? Reproduction is not what we're talking about. We're talking about spiritual things. And by the way, you had plenty of choices prior to pregnancy. You know, you've got uh, condoms, you've got the pill, you've got gels, you've got abstinence, you've got all of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, out of all, well, I should say, out of all those things, abstinence is the one that works 100% of the time, right? Right. But you've got all of those choices you could have made that you didn't. What spirit were you following? I can tell you, because I've probably done it myself, and that's lust. Now you know why lust is so bad, right? What's it lead to? All the other bad choices we probably make. The physical body is the home or what many consider to be the temple. The owner of that home or that temple is the soul of the one who was put together with it in the womb. Let me say that again. Your body is owned by the soul that it was put together with in the womb. No one. And I mean absolutely no one, not a physical person, not a divine being, has the authority to force you to allow something else to live in your body. No one has the authority to tell you you need to evict a spirit from your body. No one, not even Ernest Ainsley, has the authority to evict anything living in your house. Not even with your permission. Let me say that again. You can't give someone else permission to remove that spirit. You have to do it. It has to be your choice. You have to speak the words. When the divine spirit went to be the lying spirit in the mouths of the prophets in in 1 Kings that we talked about earlier, they, they found a way in. Whether they enticed them, whether they, however they did it, they found a way in. I have said before that there are, um, people in the world today who are doing the will of God even though they don't realize they're doing it. They are willing and unwilling participants. Those prophets were probably unwilling participants, right? Right. They became willing participants. They just didn't know it. 
the, the, the Roman soldier who was driving the nails through the hands and feet of Yeshua when he said, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, were unwilling participants. They, they had no clue. They just knew they had a job to do or they were going to get killed, right? right? If they didn't do what they were told to do, they would be killed. Now, the same thing with these spirits happens. You know, if we agree to follow the unholy spirit, they can be extremely enticing. They're always welcoming. You know, I've been around, this is, this is going to sound uh, accusal, and it kind of is. I've been around uh, people who claim to be Christians, and when they see somebody that, uh, just based on their appearance, they prejudge them. And they don't want anything to do with them. Maybe uh, they look a certain way or they're acting a certain way. But you know what? If the Holy Spirit is telling you you need to avoid someone because of uh, certain situations when you're in a position to help, you might not be listening to the Holy Spirit. But guess who's always willing to accept these folks? The unholy spirits. It doesn't matter what they are. They are so willing to accept. They will accept a young person into a lifestyle that's going to lead to uh, any number of things. Immorality, addiction, premature death. That's the problem you get into when you go down that road. Which is why, Christians, you need to be a little more careful about um, you know, when somebody walks into your church the first time, there's <laughs> this is, I'm going I'm going to split the difference here. I'm going to say there's two basic types of churches. One where they people kind of stand back and look at them like, who's this person? What are they doing here? You know, they they, they don't look like us. They don't they don't even smell like us. And then you have the other kind of church where somebody new walks in, and you know the first thing they do is hover over them and offer to do anything for them so they can get them to keep coming back. <laughs> right? We, right. We, I've seen it both ways. <laughs> I very rarely see it in the middle. Very rarely see it in the middle. You know, somebody new comes into church, it's like fresh meat for the choir pew, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Whether they can sing or not. <laughs> but it's true. How you look at people, how you, you know, what spirit are you following when you're doing that? It amazes me. Now, I hope you're still asking why the New Testament uses descriptions like casting out spirits and demons. Oh, it's the Greek influence. You know, even the early church fathers didn't question that. It had become so ingrained and integrated as a part of uh, societal tradition. We actually get a better example of uh, re the, the reality in Matthew 10.8. Most English translations will say, you know, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you have received, freely give, right? Everybody should be familiar with that. And most English translations kind of agree, although um, not all of the early manuscripts agree about uh, Matthew 10.1. I will throw that out there. There's a lot of discrepancy uh, when it comes to this. As I was looking around, I finally reached up and I pulled down my copy of George Howard's Shem Tov Hebrew Matthew and I looked at what it says in Hebrew. After everything that I'd been looking for, after everything I've done, and then I read this. Now, when uh, Howard translated it, he, he kind of stuck with the familiar, but that's not what it says. It says to purify the lepers and those with unclean spirits. Purify. Doesn't say cast them out. It says purify those with. Because the language in Hebrew is understood that you don't have the legal authority to remove anything living 
in someone else's house. Remember the example of the devil that the disciples could not cast out, Matthew ten seventeen. They said, why couldn't we cast out this demon? Well, Shem Tov says, why couldn't we bind that spirit? When we're helping people to clean their own personal temple, we do sometimes need to use our authority over the unholy spirits to, to shut them up, right? Sometimes we need to just quiet them so that the legal owner of that body is able to be in control of that situation and make the decision to either repent or continue to follow the unholy spirit. The choice is up to them. You know, it's kind of like a spiritual intervention, right? But, it, you know, if the spirit of the demon is too strong, it first does need to be starved. It needs to be weakened. So then we are able to quiet the spirit so the soul of the person can be in control of the physical body once again. And that's a big reason. Uh, when people come to me with a spiritual problem, I often suggest that they starve the spirit anyway. They weaken it to the point where they are completely in control and can know and understand to make the decision they need to make. No matter what the addiction is, if it needs to be stopped, no matter what the problem is, you know, if it's depression or anxiety, you know, if it's possible at all, remove yourself from whatever is causing that depression, whatever's causing that anxiety. Whatever's going on needs to be, you know, you need to, to make that spirit hungry. You need to weaken it down just like uh, the physical body gets when it doesn't eat, right? We need to view the things we see in our entertainment industry and even a lot about what we read from Christian pastors. We need to view that as just plain wrong because they're presenting spiritual assets from a position of pagan tradition or doctrine and not from an actual biblical authoritative source. It's that simple. They're, they're using the traditions because it was so ingrained that it became when <laughs> when the, the church was putting together the Bible and they were going through these things and trying to figure out how to say these things, there was so much that had been ingrained in tradition and society that they just accepted, well, this has got to be the way it was. You know, it can't be that, you know, no, we know how to, we know how to, get rid of spirits we talk to them we shout at them we we cast them out of people no you didn't you didn't and the thing is the hebraic writings from moses through malachi all agree on what to do it wasn't until the the greek influence got hold of it and changed it that now we have uh, people standing in, and I'll, I don't want to really get into the whole uh, faith healing kind of thing because that's a little different too. But we have people today who are writing television shows and you know what? They might as well be writing pastor sermons when they start talking about this stuff because that's where they're getting, or it seems like that's where they're getting their information from because it's so ingrained, it's so integrated into the traditions and into the doctrines and it's wrong. And hopefully you've seen some examples where I've showed you that it's wrong. Okay? Now, here's where I do need to make a little bit of an advertisement. If you if you think you're being influenced by the Holy Spirit, there is something you can do. You are the legal owner of your physical body. You have been given the authority to allow who and what you want to live inside you. You can invite the Holy Spirit to live with you uh, right along next to your soul. And uh, he will help you follow the Creator's instructions. You have every legal right and authority to evict any unholy spirit. You know, it, it's basically a threshold co covenant. when And it's the most common covenant that, that we use, even today. Somebody knocks on your door, says, can I come in? And you have the choice. You can either let them in or you can say, nope. Close the door in her face, right? That That's your choice. If you let them in, once they step across that threshold, it's why it's called a threshold covenant. Once they step into your house, across that doorway, 
they are then bound by the rules of your house. If they violate the rules of your house, when you ask them to leave, they have to leave. If they don't want to leave, that's when you have to force them out, right? And there's various ways of doing that. Like I said, weaken them down, starve them out. You know, you're in, <laughs> you may find yourself in spiritual warfare. Lay siege to wherever they're at. Right? It's just, you know, you've heard of, you know about surrounding the places and starving them out. Right? Don't give them food. Don't give them water. Cut off the air that they breathe. Starve them out. Weaken them down to the point where you can force them out. If you need help, a good place to go, of course, is GiveGodNani.com. Okay, it can, it can give you some direction. Start making those little changes. You know, it is absolutely possible to, I hate to say this, kind of sneak up on some unholy spirits while you have the opportunity. And then surround them. And then kick them out. And then say, okay, I know that didn't work. Holy Spirit needs to get in here, right? It needs to be the one because I need some help. Because you're not going to do it on your own. There is no gray area. You either will follow the Holy Spirit and follow the instructions from God, live the way you're designed to live, or you're going to follow a non-Holy Spirit. That choice is completely up to you. But there is no gray area. You can't do both. It's impossible to do both. No one has the authority to make that decision for you. It must be you. Uh, you know, if you go to Give God 90, there is a contact uh, information there. If you need to contact us for more help, be more than happy to help you. We will guide you in the direction you need to go if you need that. Um, more importantly, if you... Uh, think that your fellowship group or uh, your church or even a group inside of your church needs to hear more about this, uh, contact me. There may be opportunity where I have the ability to uh, speak to you personally There's or speak to your group personally. There's always that opportunity. This, These things are too important for us to keep getting them wrong. We've got this wrong for about 1,700 years, uh, ever since the uh, Greek influence and the Roman influence has removed the Hebraic influence from Scripture in the New Testament, this is way too important to keep getting it wrong. We've got to stop thinking about uh, exorcism as the way it's thought of in the movies or even as the way it's thought of in our modern churches. It just doesn't work. It's magical incantations and idols, lucky charms, whatever you want to call them. They're garbage. They don't work. If you go back to the way that Moses wrote it, if you go back to the way the prophets presented it, follow their examples, that's what works. You cannot remove any unholy spirit, any demon, any devil with, you know, idols and incantations. It must be done. It must be done through prayer and repentance. It's the only way it's going to work. That is the only way, only thing that will work. You know, I, I don't know any plainer way to say that. Is there, is there an easier, plainer way to say that? I don't think so. You don't think so? <laughs> um, folks, like I said, this is too important. I keep getting it wrong. You've got to, to, to grasp this concept. Whatever you see in the movies, it stays in the movies. It's fiction. Most of what you're going to read from most pastors today, because they don't know these things, they haven't studied them out, they haven't proven them, it's fiction. It's wishful thinking. Stick with Scripture. Stick with what it says in the Bible. Follow those examples. Prayer and repentance 
is what will work time after time after time. How many times did the Almighty say, If you hear my voice and if you obey my commands, then I will be your God. It is conditional. You have the choice to make. I hope you make the right one. Did you have anything to add to that? Thank you for letting us come to you tonight. Okay. You're starting to play out, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the good news is you're not on a whole lot of pills, so that's always a good thing. Yes, it is. All right, everyone. That took a little longer than I expected, but not as long as I thought it might. So until Monday, have a blessed, blessed week.